Education Outreach Coordinator for New Mexico EdScore and um, your host this evening um, for this opening keynote. Um, to start our opening keynote, I would like to introduce uh, Anton Somali, the president-elect of the New Mexico Academy of Science. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everybody at EBSCOR who made this possible. And thanks our speaker, Dr. Larry Crumpler. I'm Anton Somali, president-elect of the New Mexico Academy of Science. And I, I would like you to visit our website, nmas.org and learn more about NMAS. We are working with EBSCOR to bring you this keynote speech and the annual symposium. First, I'll introduce our speaker, our keynote speaker. Thank you, Dr. Crumpler. Dr. Larry Crumpler is a research curator at the New Mexico Museum of Natural History and Science. He received his doctorate from the University of Arizona in Planetary Sciences and MS from the University of New Mexico in Geology. Prior to the museum, he worked as a research scientist at Brown University. Currently, Dr. Crumpler is a member of the Perseverance Rover Mission Science Team and was a member of the development team for a Ingenuity helicopter Previously, he was a science team member on the Mars Exploration Rover, Spirit and Opportunity missions, Mars Odyssey Gamma Ray Spectrometer, and the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter High Resolution Camera. On the Mars Exploration Rover mission, Dr. Crumpler served as a long-term planning lead and downlinked information from the rovers on a daily basis from his office at the museum. On the Perseverance mission, he is responsible for a geologic context mapping of the terrain traversed by the rover, which you will see in his presentation. Last but not least, Dr. Crumpler has just completed a book about Mars and his personal journey as a Mars scientist entitled Mission to Mars that will be published by Harper Collins starting tomorrow. So look it up, Missions to Mars. Uh, finally, Dr. Crumpler is a fellow of the Geological Society of America. So thanks for attending and let's thank and welcome our speaker, Dr. Larry Crumpler. Larry. PowerPoint, you're still on mute though. Sorry, presumably you can hear me now, right? Yes, beautiful. Okay, yeah. good, yeah. So forgot yeah, to unmute. That's a common characteristic of Zoom meetings. So anyway, uh, so hopefully I won't run over time here. I It's been a long week and I might tend to ramble, so I hopefully get through all of my slides. But I wanted to kind of present you with kind of a, a little overview of what we've been doing with the Perseverance rover. And uh, it's uh, now... Sol or Mars Day since landing, 256. Uh, we landed in February and uh, we've been exploring the floor of a place called Jezero Crater, which I'll discuss in a second. And um, it's about, uh, what, eight o'clock at night at uh, Perseverance. So it's going to sleep right now for the night, no nighttime observations. And so uh, this is a good time to uh, to talk about what we've been up to for the past uh, uh, several months. So um, let's dive right in. Uh, what I wanted to do is start off talking a little bit about how we got to where we are now with the Mars exploration. Uh, you know, it wasn't that long ago, just 50 years ago, that uh, we had never really seen Mars up close. We had had 
a view that look pretty much like the view over here on the right, basically telescopic views of Mars, in which all we could see were these strange dark blotches, maybe a polar cap and uh, bright uh, reddish uh, terrain in between the dark blotches. And so that led to this map that's over here on the right hemisphere of this image in the center of the screen uh, that for a long time was really our view of Mars. It was a place that was mysterious. We knew it had an atmosphere. We knew it had potentially uh, lots of interesting things going on and, and a long geologic history. But all we could see were these blotches and uh, the uh, it was uh, really a, a great deal of hope was placed in when we went to Mars finally with spacecraft or something to understand what these blotches were and understand the rest of Mars. And it turns out, as I'll show in a second, the blotches had absolutely nothing to do with anything. <laughs> because as time progressed, we got clearer images of Mars and Mars became more of the image that we have over here on the left side of this image in the center of the screen, uh, in which it became clear that the blotches were unrelated really to the physical characteristics of the planet Mars. Mars turned out to be a very dynamic geologic planet. It had volcanoes such as the Tharsis volcanoes we see here, including the great uh, Olympus Mons volcano. And it had uh, canyons and it had uh, wind streaks, uh, clearly an atmosphere that was capable of blowing sand around and many, many other characteristics, including riverbeds and so on. So it uh, turned out to be a very exciting planet. We only learned that after we started sending spacecraft there. And, and of course, today our view is the view that we have over here on the far left, which is basically a view of looking at Mars at the surface as a very geologic place with real landscapes in a place that can be explored. Mars has the same surface area as all of the continents on the Earth. So we've got a lot of uh, terrain to explore. So essentially what we're embarking on here is nothing less than the exploration of a new world, sensu stricto. And we now have air photos, which are basically the high resolution uh, orbiter camera views of Mars, where we can see all sorts of interesting uh, geology and layers, as well as all sorts of atmospheric effects on the surface. And of course, now we're actually on the ground with rovers, ground pounding, look at individual outcrops, looking indeed at individual rocks, looking indeed at individual grains, crystals within the rocks, much as you would do with field geology here on the Earth. So anyway, the whole arc of discovery from the late 50s to the current day is a, a, a journey uh, to a new world. And I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about that in the next slide. Basically, um, our you know really detailed view of Mars began in, in the 65 when we flew past Mars with Mariner 4 spacecraft, US Mars Mariner 4 spacecraft. And it took a few grainy pictures it showed some craters. Everybody was very disappointed. They thought Mars was a lot more dynamic than that. It looked like the moon. But it wasn't until we uh, sent several more spacecraft, Mariner 6 and 7, and then finally with 9 actually going into orbit and observing the surface, discovering that Mars actually had volcanoes and canyons and, and riverbeds that we began to realize that Mars was actually way more exciting than we originally thought. This sort of follows the pattern with Mars. We we think we understand something about it. And then the next you know, mission or the next observation, we totally change our views totally and radically from what we held before. So I like to think of Mars as being kind of a trickster planet where it really likes to sort of do a bait and switch on us. So it's been doing that all along. So uh, following uh, the successful Mariner 9 mission, it was in the mid 70s, uh, 75, we sent the Viking orbiters uh, to Mars, taking even greater high resolution images globally of the planet. And on that mission, we also sent the first successful landers down to Mars, the Viking landers one and two, where we landed in two places on Mars and finally got a view of Mars as a re very real place with real rocks, understood something about the, uh, the nature of the rocks, the chemistry of the rocks, and the nature of the environment. <clears throat> and then. Literally, there was a gap of 20 years, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second, between the Viking missions 
And the next missions to Mars, the Mars Global Surveyor in the late 90s, uh, uh, along with the lander, the Sojourner rover, which was a small microwave oven sized rover that we first sent to Mars in 96. And it roved like 100 meters around the lander. And we were started taking our first baby steps with how to actually uh, control a rover on the surface of a distant planet. And then there followed a series of missions, orbiter missions, subsequent to that in the 2001 Mars Odyssey, which was uh, the first look at the global chemistry of the surface of Mars. And then 2005 with Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, that's where we sent the missions with the uh, high resolution camera, the high rise uh, camera that takes these images that look like air photos that you may see in news feeds from time to time. Uh, and then, of course, uh, more recently, the MAVEN spacecraft, which in 2013 was sent to uh, study the atmosphere and the atmospheric history of Mars. Meanwhile, back on the surface, in 2004, we landed Spirit and Opportunity, the first real rovers to explore more than just beyond the lander located and it was with those that we developed all the techniques that we use with modern rovers, how to control them, what the daily operations look like, how to use instruments remotely to understand the geology the same way you would with field geology here on the Earth. So we learned a lot with those and those uh, propagated forward to our current rovers. But in the meantime, we also sent another lander, Phoenix, near the uh, polar latitudes. Uh, and uh, we learned about uh, some of the chemistry of the surface in the high latitudes. And then, of course, Curiosity, the big rover previous to Perseverance, landed in 2012 in uh, Gale Crater and was exploring the sediments that filled Gale Crater. Subsequently, in 2018, we had InSight, which is the uh, lander, not a rover, but it had on board uh, seismic instruments for really for the first time, understanding the interior of Mars. We never knew what the size of the core of Mars was and how frequent uh, Mars quakes were on Mars. But now we know because we've been observing Mars quakes on Mars with insight for many years now. <clears throat> and then of course, in 2020, we sent uh, Perseverance, which landed at the beginning of this year in February. And, uh, and that's basically uh, got a task that uh, uh, is on a track to provide samples that will be returned to Earth by a Mars sample return mission later in this decade. So that's that's kind of where we are in this grand arc of exploration of this new world. So uh, just to cast this in another perspective, I thought it'd be interesting to lay out from 1960 all the way over to the present. Here are all the successful Mars missions that have gone to Mars. And uh, the different colors on the bars here represent different uh, countries that have sent spacecraft. So the first successful Mars missions were, of course, the United States with Mariner 4 and then Mariner 9 and with the uh, Mariners uh, 6 and 7. Then uh, the uh, Soviet Union or Russia uh, uh, had a successful orbiter uh, along with the same time that Mariner 9 arrived. And of course, then we went to uh, Viking landers. And then there was this great long period with the exception of one little short-lived uh, mission called Phobos II by the Russians of about 20 years in which we had no missions. So all of us were really building our knowledge of Mars essentially on the basis of what we learned from the Viking uh, one and two orbiters and landers. <clears throat> And then, of course, we had Mars Global Surveyor in the late 90s. And then, of course, it's been a, a feast since then of various missions, including missions sent by the European Space Agency. And uh, even India got into the act a few years ago. And then more recently, of course, China is now, as well as the uh, uh, United Arab Emirates that just sent a spacecraft that arrived at Mars at about the same, same time as Perseverance. But <clears throat> anyway, this is sort of the, the long history of Mars exploration. And I thought it would be interesting to talk about, you know, how 
how um, you know a career develops during that time period. So I've placed down here on the bottom, you know, my career path during that time period. And so basically I got my start in elementary school, you know, just, or essentially I got my start before elementary school, way back in the late fifties, in which there were all these wonderful science fiction um, movies showing uh, exploration of other planets. And the, the oddly enough, the uh, surfaces of those planets were always very geological looking, it looked something like, the American Southwest. And uh, so that was very exciting. And in elementary school, you know, I sort of continued interest both in the idea of exploration, other planets, space, and of course, Mars, because we were all starting to talk about Mars at that point with the inception of the space program. So I had this interest in both basically exploration and surfaces, kind of something about, you know, um, exploring exotic alien places, and then an interest in space science, which sort of evolved from that, which was essentially astronomy and planetary astronomy. And that continued pretty much through high school until college, and I had to decide kind of what I was going to really study. And so we uh, had a long discussion with advisors at that point. It wasn't clear at that time. This was the uh, late 60s wasn't clear what you went into to become one of these uh, new scientists doing Mars missions and things. So uh, they, there was discussion with, is it astronomy or is it, uh, you know, they're kind of looking at surfaces, maybe it's geology. And so uh, I like the idea of geology because I was interested in exploration. I was interested in the history of geology because of course, as a kid, I was interested in, you know, fossils and dinosaurs. And I had studied a little bit about the associated earth history. <clears throat> so I decided to go into geology as a specialty. And so that continued pretty much through college and through the master's degree where I did a lot of field geology, really becoming a geologist essentially. But at the same time, I was exploring options and possibilities for planetary science, including participating in the Viking mission to Mars, the first lander and, uh, successful high resolution orbiters. And then since then, you know, other missions like Magellan mission to Venus and then others to Mars subsequently. Meanwhile, uh, uh, on a separate track, I continue to be interested in this idea of field geology where you go out and you understand geology. It's kind of like exploring new worlds when you do field geology. And uh, I was particularly interested in volcanology and and, and the volcanology of New Mexico, especially since this is the land of a thousand volcanoes. So it's kind of interesting to look back. So basically I had this dual interest that converged on one topic during the college years of career formation. And then it immediately split again into those same two fields, those same two areas. So the message here I think is that for anybody who doesn't know what they wanna do uh, don't know what to go into. The idea is to kind of look back and see, there must be a couple of things that really hold your fascination and uh, to see uh, which of those uh, can be blended into one specialty that has the possibility of being used for, again, going back and looking at both of these specialties. And so that's kind of what, you know, what happened to me. And so that's where I ended up here today still being a field geologist, but also being a mission scientist on a mission to Mars, which is essentially doing, guess what, field geology on Mars. So that's kind of how it, how it works. So that's something to think about as you look forward to your career. So I've taken up enough time now, probably spent more time than I should, but <clears throat> so it's time to get back to the rover, the mission. So the mission itself is uh, a mission that is designed to go and uh, collect samples. That's really the primary mission of Perseverance Rover. Uh, and we want to collect these samples uh, for potentially bringing samples back to Earth. And uh, everybody knows that in order to understand uh, the importance of a sample, you need to know its context. So knowing the geology of where those samples are collected is very important. So hence the field geology, in the understanding of the geologic context. The other important component of the mission, of course, is what we call astrobiology. That is, 
possible life on other worlds, in this case on Mars. And so the goal of the mission for doing the geology and collecting the samples is to see if there is uh, biologic potential on Mars in its past. And uh, so that's a really fundamental goal. So that feeds back into the first goal. And then the final goal is to prepare for humans on Mars. And, and to do that, we're testing uh, several technologies. Uh, the helicopter is one of them, but another one is a, an instrument called uh, MOXIE, which is over here, where I talk about the instruments. MOXIE is an experiment to actually generate oxygen from CO2. And we've run that uh, several times. In fact, we run it quite frequently. And uh, they're exploring different uh, temperatures, environmental conditions for generating oxygen, but it works wonderfully. We've generated quite a bit of oxygen uh, just literally from thin air. Uh, and Mars air is indeed thin at about one one hundredths of the atmospheric pressure of the Earth, but it's all carbon dioxide. <clears throat> So that's one instrument that we have on, on board uh, Perseverance, but that's mostly a technology thing. Of course, we have the usual cameras. Uh, we, Mascam Z is a high resolution color zoomable panoramic camera, camera uh, that can really uh, see the surface in detail. It also has multi-spectral capabilities, so we can talk about the uh, uh, mineralogical composition of things by looking at their spectra. We have a thing called SuperCam, which is the, you know, the laser that shoots rocks uh, developed by uh, Roger Weens at the uh, Los Alamos National Labs and run by Roger and his group. It has, uh, of course, the famous laser zapper, but it also has a zoomable camera called uh, Super uh, or RMI that can actually take uh, telescopic views of uh, distant terrains. And it also has a microphone, which we've used to listen to sounds on Mars, like the rover driving winds and helicopter noises. Uh, then we have a, a weather station, uh, Meta, which uh, temperature, pressure, humidity, barometric pressure, also looks at uh, clouds uh, overhead and so on. And last but not least, of course, on the end of the arm are some instruments that are you know, our field geological tools. And, those include basically a, a high resolution microscope, Watson, and a couple of spectrometers that are actually pretty good at detecting um, biological organic compounds and other things. So that's uh, for looking at things really up close. I mean, we're talking like micron scale. And then on the other side, we have another instrument called Pixel, which is basically our X-ray fluorescence uh, spectrometer, which we use to get the composition of uh, rocks. <clears throat> and uh, this one has capability of looking at you know, pinpoint accuracy. So we can literally get the composition of individual mineral grains in a rock face. And then, of course, we have a drill and coring device for actually collecting samples, which are brought back to the rover and put on a device that basically stores them on board. And the way the sample thing operates, of course, is so uh, that we store them on board and then we cache them in, the, in a few locations on the surface for later retrieval. We'll talk about that in a second. <clears throat> and then last but not least is the Ingenuity helicopter, which is basically a technology demonstration experiment. So uh, it basically is essentially, for all intents and purposes, a separate mission that is operating at the same time and close to the same place as the rover. And we've successfully flown that now for uh, 15 times on the surface of Mars, and it's proved wonderfully successful. And I'll spend some time talking about that in a second. <clears throat> so where did we land? Uh, so here's the yellow dot is where we landed on the northwest edge of a thing called Isidus Planitia, which is a large ancient impact basin on Mars. Uh, on the edge of the uh, highland terrain, which is some of the oldest terrain on Mars. And um, other landers, uh, we'll zoom in on that in a second, other landers in this hemisphere, the U.S. Uh, Curiosity rover in 2012 landed down here in Gale Crater. To the north of that little ways is the uh, InSight uh, seismometer that landed in 2018. And then, of course, a few weeks after Perseverance, 
the Chinese uh, rover Zhurong landed up here in an area called Utopia Planitia. And then way down just off the bottom of this map is where Spirit landed back in uh, 2004. But let's zoom in and find out why we were interested in this particular area. It's an area called the uh, Jezero Crater. It's about uh, 30 kilometers across. And uh, it has a very interesting characteristic. There's a big river channel that comes into it. And we suspect that this was filled with a large lake at one time. And I'll show you why in a second. But this box here, for uh, scale purposes, is the same scale as this box drawn around Albuquerque. So it's like a box that goes all the way from the base of the Sandia Mountains over to, say, the you know, Unser Boulevard here. So uh, we landed out here, I don't know, it's uh, near the university or something, and we're going to be driving over here, probably up into the North Valley, essentially. <clears throat> but let's zoom in on this box. So here's the box again. So here's a zoom in of that box. And so the idea is that uh, here's the rim of Jezero Crater. And here there's a channel, a river channel that comes into the crater. And where it enters, it has deposited a large delta. So uh, the delta gives us a major clue that this crater was originally filled with water. It was a large lake because anytime you have a large body of water and you have a river entering it from the land, it deposits its sediments. As the water slows down, they settle out and you develop what we call a river delta. <clears throat> An interesting thing about deltas is there are very fine-grained sediments that settle out of the water and as a consequence they're good at preserving things. So not only are they good at preserving fine details and sediments, they're good at preserving things like fossils and even microscopic fossils. So the concept then is that um, we are looking at a delta uh, where as the road layers have been eroded back, there may be exposures of interesting things preserved by that uh, deltaic environment. So we landed out here, however, about a kilometer away from the delta. And we've been embarking on a mission to actually explore this area of the crater floor, which we believe is covered with lava flows that are much later than the delta and so we want to understand those and sample those because if we can bring those back to Earth and we can get an age estimate, you know, the maximum age of things here in the crater. And then later when we get ages from the rocks on the delta, we'll have, you know, a nice stratigraphy with a nice absolute Martian time scale. So the landing day, of course, was very spectacular because on this mission we actually had cameras and movie cameras taking pictures of the events. So they're pretty spectacular. In this uh, frame, you can actually see the, uh, the uh, sky crane that we uh, descended from on cables to the surface as it was hovering over the Martian surface. Meanwhile, there are pictures taken of the lander or of the rover as it, from the, uh, from the uh, hovering rocket pack. And of course, uh, once we landed, it flew off <clears throat> and the rover was left on the surface. So this is the uh, view from the surface. Once we landed, we landed in this beautifully flat and safe place selected by the uh, lander with a, what was called terrain relative navigation as a very flat and safe place. And there's the delta out in the distance. And uh, there's the rim of Jezero Crater in the far distance. And here's some blast marks from the rocket pack uh, as it was hovering. Uh, as we were dropped to the surface at this location. This view shows you what you're kind of looking at in that overhead view again. So rim of the crater here. And then this peak right here is a remnant of a delta that we'll see again in a second, uh, sitting out there uh, alone out in the uh, terrain. So the delta has actually been kind of eroded back. So that's great. So that means all the layers have been exposed and whatnot. So that's the view from the landing site. And of course, we spent the first 60 SOLs or Mars days uh, deploying the uh, helicopter ingenuity to the surface. There was a series of complex maneuvers we had to execute to do that. So we, anyway, 
when all was said and done, we finally got the helicopter onto the surface and we drove off a little ways and immediately took this selfie uh, showing a proud uh, rover parent with its uh, little um, uh, helicopter offspring sitting on the surface. And so then we drove off a distance to observe the first flights of the helicopter. And uh, the helicopter, meanwhile, took to the air for several flights. This is one of the, uh, this is on the third flight, a view from the color camera looking down at the surface from about 10 meters altitude. Here's the uh, foot pad of the helicopter. There's the helicopter shadow down here. Here's all of our rover tracks. So the helicopter just took off from here. Here are the tracks where we drove off into the distance to observe it. So, uh, so it just so happens that when this color camera, which looks obliquely across the surface, as we flew this way, we actually caught an image of the rover. And there it is in the upper left corner. So you can actually see we actually are on the surface of Mars. Uh, and uh, you're kind of looking at the back end of the rover here. This is the radioisotope thermal generator. Uh, and there's the um, camera. It's kind of looking over its shoulder back at the uh, helicopter taking a movie of the uh, first flights. And here's one of those movies. So uh, we actually uh, uh, did a series of flights near the rover up to the fifth flight, uh, Sol 76. And here you can actually see the helicopter actually flying on the surface of Mars. First time an aerial vehicle flew on the surface of Mars. Incidentally, it also carried a small postage stamp fragment of the fabric from the original uh, Wright Brothers flyer. So uh, that uh, piece of the Wright Brothers flyer actually flew, uh, did a historic first flight on a, another planet as well as on the Earth. And this is sort of the path that you're seeing in this uh, movie here. So uh, as we, this is the path we've taken since the landing day. So here's where we are today. There's the delta up there. And uh, there's kind of this rough terrain here. And there's the lava flows that sort of flowed up against it. And we've been driving south along the margins of that, trying to understand the nature of this terrain and trying to uh, get a look at this uh, rough badlands here. And uh, the only place we could find to enter it was way over here. So we drove all the way down here. And meanwhile, the green dots represent where the helicopter has landed during that traverse. So for a long time, the, we would be driving along, the helicopter would jump in front of us and we would encounter it again. And then it would uh, jump ahead again and we'd, we'd encounter it again. But then at this point, it actually flew all the way across an epic flight across the Badlands over to this location, the place that nobody had ever seen before, selected its own landing site and landed over there. And then as subsequently, that was flight nine, and subsequently has uh, executed uh, a series of six more flights in this terrain around here, exploring our traverse uh, possibilities uh, as we tried to enter these Badlands. But anyway, as we were driving along, sometimes we got the feeling that we were being um, stalked by the helicopter because uh, here's a series of images taken at different locations as we were driving along. And every time we stopped, we would take the panorama and there was the helicopter sitting out there staring at us, almost like it was jeering at us, you know, saying, hey, you know, what the, what's going on? You know, I've been here for days, you know, and, and w w why are you so slow? And uh, that's just uh, one of the beauties of a helicopter. It can cover immense amounts of terrain and, um, you know, get to places very quickly and see them from the air. So uh, anyway, so that's uh, kind of the, the helicopter and successful mini flights and during those flights, it's taken these beautiful images, uh, color images, and as well as some downward looking black and white images, we call them nav cam images. And these are uh, taken frequently enough, we can actually turn these into movies. And so in a second, we'll look at a movie of one of those flights. And so this is up to flight 14. Uh, and uh, this is uh, some of the terrain that it's actually captured during those flights. And we've driven into the, some of those and they've been wonderfully helpful. And I wanted to show you this image right here 
uh, looking down from the helicopter as it flew along this track at a place where we had previously occupied. The rover had moved on at that point uh, when the uh, helicopter flew over it, but I've placed a model of the helicopter of the rover uh, at the proper scale in the image to give you an idea of the scale looking down. So this is a helicopter color image looking down on the surface of Mars. There's our rover tracks. So you can see the wonderful detail. So this is like, you know, a field geologist dream having a you know, personal air photo machine taking images from 10 to 30 meters up of the terrain that you're trying to map. And uh, let's see, so uh, I think next I uh, show a little movie where the helicopter takes off from this location. It's going to be the black and white downward looking movie as it flies over this big escarpment right here and flies out across this forbidden badlands all the way to the escarpment on the other side. And uh, so that was a pretty epic journey, but uh, let's go look at that. So here's the nav cam, uh, nav cam looking down as it takes off. And it's now going to fly down to the southwest, which is up here. There's our rover tracks. And it's getting oriented. And so it's starting. And it's pretty impressive. It goes over to the escarpment here. It's flying over the rocks. Here's the escarpment up here. And it stops, gets its bearings, because it might want to come back here if it has a problem out there. And so it takes off and flies this epic distance all the way across these dunes and outcrops of these badlands. And this, this uh, movie goes on for a couple of minutes, pretty much looks like what you're seeing here, dunes with small outcrops. And it goes on until we reach the other side way over here. And here's the color image here, looking out across the surface of Mars from about 30 meters altitude. Here's the foot pad again. Here's Jezero Crater Rim. There's uh, the uh, strange little remnant of the Delta sitting out there. That's where it's flying to. And Scarpment on the other side of these badlands. <clears throat> so this gives you an idea of what it's like to fly on Mars uh, at about an altitude of 30 meters. So uh, wonderful instrument. And so hopefully we'll have many of those in the future. When we got to the other side, we did some more flights around here. And it, at one point it looked back where the rover had finally arrived at this point. And you can actually see the rover sitting way out there. And again, you can see the rover uh, sitting. This is where we actually were working on our first uh, sample quarrying activity which I'll talk about in a second. Anyway, subsequently, it's uh, flown many times, and uh, it's, um, it's been a very successful mission. Other things that we've been doing, of course, is understanding the regional geology. Here's the MassCam Z, or sometimes referred to as ZCam telephoto view of this uh, delta remnant that I talked about. Uh, uh, it's named Kodiak. And the beauty of it if, is, of course, you can see, well, it, looks like delta sediments. I mean, there's beautiful horizontal sediments and tilted sediments from where the front of a delta builds out. It's kind of a sloping surface. And then that gets eroded off as more deltaic sediments come in on top of it. There was a recent science paper uh, that was uh, published uh, a couple of weeks ago about uh, the first uh, results from really intensely studying this with all of our zoomable cameras or super cam RMI images and so on. And uh, it indeed has uh, some interesting characteristics. And we've already learned a lot about the delta from that. In the background is the uh, rim of Jezero Crater. So you can see it's like a mountain in the background. And we're going to climb over that eventually uh, as the mission progresses. Other things we've been doing, you remember I mentioned you know, the telescopic uh, RMI capability of SuperCam. So here's a, a series of telescopic images we did of the uh, edge of the delta as we were sitting way down here, looking way up at the edge of the delta over a kilometer away uh, to understand the nature of these layers. And here's what that looks like. So <laughs> beautifully, wonderful high resolution image from far away. of Austria. And we've already analyzed these. There's a a channel uh, sand uh, boulder, actually, conglomerate here. Uh, we've already learned that apparently a lot of this stuff was deposited here 
as the uh, lake level was deposit uh, dropping with time, and uh, there were a series of flood events that were depositing really coarse materials on top of some of the fine grain sediments. So anyway, so that's uh, some of the things we've been doing. The other thing is, you know, we take these uh, images at the end of every drive, and almost every single one of them is photobombed by dust devils. And of course, these are, you know, the typical dust whirlwinds or dust devils that you see here in New Mexico, same scale, same speed, same size, everything. And they happen like two o'clock in the afternoon, especially when the ground gets heated up and you get convection. And um, so we see these, like it's one of the most dust devil infested places. In fact, if you had looked carefully at that movie of the helicopter uh, earlier uh, flying, uh, in the background, there was a dust devil going on in the background of that. So anyway, uh, lots of cool things happening. I've got a captive audience, so I always have to talk about what I'm doing on the mission. So I try to keep it short. But my goal is to do field geologic mapping on Mars, or what we call in situ geologic mapping. And I summarize it as GXM, geologic context mapping. And the idea is that as you drive along, it's kind of like walking along. You can see out on either side of you. You can see things closer, very clear, and things further out, not so clear. But the things close in, you can also touch and look at and analyze and understand their geology, their, their, their type of rock or their lithology and so on. And so you can kind of project some of that out into your surroundings, out to a limit to where you can see. And so that's kind of the concept of the investigation, to take these, uh, the data we're collecting at the rover and map it into a series of levels of, you know, really uh, of uh, uh, capability of really uh, precision uh, saying what you're looking at. And then, of course, identifying, you know, the attitude of units and so on. And so uh, it goes out to a, a maximum of about 120 meters, but generally around 30 meters. And so you can map a little uh, circle in a geologic map as you drive along. And you just keep overlapping these as you drive along. Uh, also, uh, the uh, other instrument I forgot to mention about when I was talking about the instruments is an instrument mounted on the bottom of the rover called RIMFAX, which is a ground penetrating radar. Uh, and it's uh, on Earth, we use that for some shallow, um, you know, uh, uh, investigations of the subsurface. Uh, it's particularly used like you know, for locating buried pipes and things like that. But uh, we can also use it on Mars to adapt much greater depth because of the low water content of the soil allows radar signals to penetrate fairly deeply. And so anyway, it takes its measurements continuously as we drive along. So now we actually can see, you know, we almost have, you know, it looks almost like one of these seismograms of the cross sections of the Earth. You can actually see layers underneath your feet and map those to the layers or units that you're seeing on the surface and do true geologic um, uh, section maps. So anyway, that's what that's all about. And uh, so the way it works is you take the image and you map the geology on it. And in... For uh, distant things, you can actually see them really uh, much better than they appear in this image because you can zoom in on them with your uh, high resolution cameras. For instance, in this case, this outcrop taken by <clears throat> uh, the Z cam. So now you just simply map that to the overhead projection of the nav cam, 360 degree panorama onto the surface. And you can just map the geology. Uh, based on what you're seeing at your feet and what you can identify by local remote sensing. So I've done that along the entire traverse uh, to date. And so this is just a map showing different colors, showing different types of rock that we've seen along the traverse. And here's a zoom in a part of it. And this is where we are sitting today, uh, preparing to do another drill core on a, one of these rocks out here in the Badlands. So anyway, that's my investigation and that's all I'll say about it. Uh, so just to give you an idea of what it's kind of like to rove on the surface of Mars and try to understand things. Here, so here's a, a view around the Sol 137 again, I think, where the rover is sitting in here in the uh, orbital high-rise image. 
sitting on one of these uh, strange polygonal patterns of rock. Uh, and looking off to the margins for these rocks here, this is what the scene looks like. So these rocks here, you can't see these, they're behind this ridge, but these rocks are these big, blocky, dense, dark blocks of rock, which we believe are probably basaltic lava flows, but they've been really broken up, probably by impacts and things. And then they're sitting on top of this terrain, which is, you know, broken up into these weird polygons that you can see on the surface. In fact, you can map the ones that you can see here. For instance, this one is this one, and this one out here is this one, and this dark band here is this band. So, so this gives you an idea of what it's like. And you know, we're trying to understand the nature of the difference between these two, by the way, because it turns out the composition of these dark, massive, very dense looking rocks is the same as these rocks down here, which are very granular and very really weathered looking. And not only that, they, you know, they, they have little nubs on them that consist of these dark rocks and there's the transition is totally continuous. There's no contact or anything. So we're trying to understand what the heck these rocks are. So we're still working on that. So we continue driving south and uh, we're again still in pretty much that same terrain. It looks very similar. Again, the granular polygonal terrain with lots of fractures going through it and then the dark rocks in the distance. So we decided we, about this time, our coring instrument actually came online. It took many weeks, months to actually get many of the instruments ramped up to actual flight capability. That's a, another long story. <clears throat> But it finally came online, so we decided, you know, here we are, we're on this rock, we would like to understand the nature of it. We would like, in fact, to bring a sample back of it. So we undertook to do a series of uh, experiments uh, that culminated with a coring opportunity. And one of the experiments is abrading the surface. And you can see here we've abraded it. And this is prior to the uh, activity where we blow the dust off and look at it with our microscopic imager. So here's what that looks like. So here's the abrasion, then, then we hit it with a little puff of gas and blow the dust off. Uh, it's a wonderful tool. We don't have to use a brush. We just use a little puff of nitrogen gas uh, to blow the dust off the outcrop. And so um, this is what the rock looked like up close then. Here's a one centimeter scale bar. Here's where the rock is on the surface in an overhead view. Again, looking at my detailed geologic map, all sorts of different lithologies mapped out here. Anyway, it's a very uh, kind of coarse grained rock. Uh, you can see all sorts of crystals in it. There's lots of darkish stains in here. So it looks like it's uh, you know, a rock that's been very, um, you know, corroded is the best word. Uh, even though uh, it has essentially a basaltic chemistry and, and so on. There's some other weird things going on here. There's some calcium sulfates and, and other sulfates, along with lots of uh, iron oxides and things like that uh, uh, that are you know, causing some of these stains. Then these pits are probably vesicles because we think most of these rocks are volcanic. Uh, and anyway, so we decided to go ahead and core it. And so here's a test of our coring device on the surface of Mars. There's Jezero Crater in the background again. So indeed it works. Uh, you know, it's kind of like a dentist, you know, holding the drill up, you know, and hitting it a couple of times. So uh, then we applied that to the surface and drilled this wonderful hole, but it had this enormous uh, pile of tailings around the hole. We looked into the hole, however, and yep, sure enough, you know, we've removed something. But then when we looked in the tube, we held the, you know, the coring tube up to the uh, cameras, the sample tube was empty. So it was like big mystery, you know, what, what happened to our sample? What did it fall out, you know, when we pulled it out of the core? Is it underneath the rover? We looked all over the place. But uh, ultimately we decided that probably this rock is really pretty corroded and it is really uh, the core simply pulverized the, uh, the the rock uh, and it, it was all exited as you know this enormous pile of tailings which characteristically had the uh, same volume as the hole so uh, we ended up with an empty uh, sample tube 
uh, which we've decided to call a Mars atmospheric sample. So while we decided you know, what to do about that, we continued on our drive. And uh, meanwhile, uh, so we, what we think happened was the rock is really pretty rotten. And it's probably a type of rock that here on the Earth we would call saprolite. It's a type of deep weathering where here, even back at the landing site, we saw a rock uh, that uh, you know had these you know typical you know fractured uh, blocky patterns and along the edges, lots of corrosion, and the interior very granular looking. Even though the rock itself probably initiated as a very dark, very fine grained uh, rock, it's uh, weathering into this sort of thing, and and that that's pretty typical of you know really uh, deeply uh, water. Uh, corroded terrains here on the Earth. And Mars was a very wet place early in its history. So I suspect that's what's what's happened to some of these rocks. In fact, we see those even here in New Mexico. Here's a typical New Mexico basalt. But in the case, this case, it was actually underneath uh, the water in a glacial, uh, an ice age lake uh, for a long period of time. And the basalt along fractures was again corroded pretty much like that uh, rock we just saw on Mars with kind of a rind around the outside weathering to kind of the spherical pattern and the formerly nice smooth dark basalt is now this very granular very grainy looking material where clumps of grains are actually being weathered out and maybe a more familiar example of it is the sandia granite where you have these beautiful rounded boulders which are really uh, you know just one end member of the uh, process of eroding out these nice angular blocks which themselves have been, you know, really uh, deeply weathered along their margins by previous, you know, 100, 300 million years ago being at the bottom of an ocean. And uh, so you get this uh, kind of uh, terrain that turns into these nice boulders that, that are very kind of granular. And then the grains themselves then shed off and make this type of very sandy, gritty material that we call grus with the rounded blocks being called tours. So that's, that's kind of what we're looking at probably on Mars, very corroded rock. So we continued driving along while we figured out what to do about this uh, sampling problem. <clears throat> and I thought this would be a good place to just briefly mention, you know, I haven't talked about the RIMFAX data, but recall as RIMFAX drives, uh, as we drive along RIMFAX takes continuous sounding profile beneath the rover. And so here's a sample of what the sounding profile of the radar looks like. So you can actually see tilted layers. And this agrees with our concept of what this terrain to the north of the traverse line here is. We think it's some material that's basically sort of uh, tilted or dipping. The layers are tilted towards the south here. And uh, we're looking at them as we cross them, uh, driving along the margin of this escarpment, which is capped by, uh, again, these dark blocky materials. So we actually um, continued along this escarpment uh, and um, visited uh, the, the escarpment here. And I think, yeah, and uh, this is the view of the escarpment. So again, this is our very granular, very eroded, corroded, type of rock and here's the basaltic cap rock again uh, with a very kind of gradational contact at best and uh, so um, we decided not to sample try to sample this stuff but we wanted to sample this so we continued driving along and got up on top of the escarpment where we could perhaps sample this stuff and so that's what um, we did for our first successful sampling attempt uh, we drove up there and we started uh, drilling on a, one of these dark basaltic rocks um, this was sol 180 at this point and uh, so we actually did two uh, core samples sometimes we like to collect two for contingency and uh, those were successful and here's the you know uh, celebratory selfie of the rover looking at its handiwork uh, doing a drill course in this rock on the surface of Mars. And we have this uh, camera called Cash Cam that's on the rover so that when we bring the core tube back to the rover and 
and prepare to seal it up for uh, storage, we can actually look down and characterize the sample that we've cored. So this is actually looking at the core sample. And so I think you recognize it looks very similar to the, you know, the brighted place that we looked at before, but it's just a lot less corroded looking. There's a lot less iron oxides going on. There's a few other strange things happening, but it's a pretty good dense rock. And so it cored beautifully. And then of course it was sealed up uh, and stored away on the rover for depositing at a couple of cache sites uh, in the future. So this is the last we see of this rock before it returns to the Earth, presumably at the end of this decade. And uh, so there it is, sealed up. So then we uh, continued driving along the escarpment. So that was down here. And uh, from one the, the next saw, saw 199 to 200, we uh, did a... Uh, drive where the rover drove itself. We told it we wanted it to go up here because we were going to launch off and try to understand these badlands from there because there was a way down from the escarpment there. And that was about 200 meters away. So we said, you know, okay, rover, do your thing. And so it drove itself. So this is a new capability with this rover where it has capability of driving itself quite rapidly over long distances. And so next, what I'm going to do is show you a view from the navigation cameras on the rover, uh, which are kind of like this, you know, the uh, 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 MassCam Z cameras, but a little bit lower resolution. That's the one that takes all of these panoramas that we've been looking at. Uh, and it takes these images as it's driving along. So you can actually see what it's like for driving over the surface of Mars. And not only that, a rover that's self-driving. So here it is. So we're driving along. Here's the escarpment over on the right. So you can literally see it avoiding you know, rocks as it drives along here, trying to weave its way in and out of everything uh, to get up to its final stopping location right of here. And from that location, then we just simply turn to the right and then descended the escarpment. Okay, so that's what we call auto nav mode. And the, the rover does that a lot and I hate it because <laughs> What happens is when you go beyond 120 meters, you go below, beyond the limits of my mapping. So that every time we do one of these 200 meter drives, you might have this big gap in my map. But uh, anyway, it gets us places quickly. And I, I suspect we're gonna be doing a lot of that in the coming months because of something that's, that's coming up. And I'll talk about that in a second. So uh, anyway, so here's, uh, we drove down into that Badlands. So this is a view of the, what the Badlands look like. Over on the right, so we're looking east here. Over the right is the escarpment we just drove along in that last image. So we drove all the way over here, and we're trying to understand what all this mess is. It's very complex, rugged relief. There are some outcrops on the tops of some of the ridges, and when we look at these, they look very fine-grained, very finely laminated, and uh, we have a lot of sedimentologists who want it to be sed or layers, but uh, you can also get uh, laminations like this in, in a variety of dense rocks. But in any case, uh, a lot of us think that it, these uh, units may be um, volcanic ash, not deltaic sediments that we were hoping for. But uh, anyway, uh, we decided we would like to sample those. So we drove to an outcrop a little bit further on here. And this is this is where we're sitting today, or, or to Sol, as we say on Mars. Uh, uh, using Mars terminology. And we're going to be drilling this rock. We just abraded it. Uh, we're going to be drilling it and uh, hopefully collecting a sample, if we're lucky, uh, to cache and bring back to Earth eventually and, and, you know, kind of understand what this terrain is. And, uh, you know, there are a couple of layers here. There's uh, actually some basaltic rocks, again, sitting on top. Uh, there's a layer here that actually is sitting on top of something that's a little bit less densely uh, uh, dense dark material and the distance is uh, kind of a ridge to give you an idea of how rugged this terrain is this is a z cam view of that distant view and there's the rim of jezero crater again and uh, so uh, this is pretty rugged terrain and we don't want to drive through it to get to the delta the delta is out of view just over the hill here but uh, we don't want to drive through it because it would take us forever winding our way in and out of all of these ridges. So what we're going to do 
as counterintuitive as it may seem, it's actually easier if we just go back the way we came and go pack past the uh, landing site and drive around the Badlands, which are here, uh, and then approach the Delta on this relatively smooth strain. So we'll probably be using a lot of that auto nav to do that. So we hope to um, you know, start on that journey in a few weeks. Uh, we'll probably be using a lot of auto nav, so a lot of long drives, but also we wanna you know, cover a couple of questions that we couldn't resolve on our way down here. So we'll be doing that and then we'll be doing in this pretty flat terrain, we'll probably be doing a lot of auto nav driving and then arriving at the foot of the Delta by the February of uh, next year. And at that point, we'll embark on a, a campaign of traversing up through the Delta. This is just a high rise image. We have color for this part, not this part. Uh, driving up to the canyons, that ought to be pretty spectacular. It'll be like driving in the Rio Puerco or something here on the earth. And uh, you know, exploring various elements of the Delta and then eventually approaching the actual river uh, valley that enters the crater rim and then going up onto the crater rim and the ancient terrain beyond and hopefully an extended mission. So uh, we've got a long ways to go. So there's going to be a lot of you know, exciting driving and a lot of epic exploration of uh, a new world coming up. And that's all going to be happening over the next few months as we drive to get to the base of the Delta. And then it really you know, gets exciting as we get into the Delta. So that's it. I just wanted to remind you that my uh, new book is basically being released tomorrow. Uh, it's called Missions to Mars. And it's all about the history of Mars exploration, what it's like to explore Mars. And you definitely will want a copy of that. Okay, so that's it. Uh, time for questions. Back to you. Hi, Larry. Uh, this is Isis, and um, I we have a few questions coming in from uh, Q and A. Thank you so much for your fascinating talk. Um, let's see. We have one from Donovan Porterfield. Is the range of rovers more limited by power or? our ability to remotely operate? Yeah, I'd have to say uh, number two, our ability to remotely operate. Uh, the power is pretty good. Uh, I mean, it does vary from day to day, but uh, depending on what other activities we're doing, but we could probably go a lot further than we do, but uh, the rover does have to find its way, uh, especially when we try to go real far. And so that takes a little bit of time. And uh, we also uh, don't want to go much further than we can uh, arguably understand wh where we're going to. So we like to kind of you know stick to something we can see from the ground in the distance, if if you know, not uh, clearly at least vaguely. So that's it's kind of the limitation right now. But uh, you can imagine if we had like a helicopter skipping out in front of us during every drive. You know we could use that data to go as far as we wanted to. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Donathan, for that question. Uh, next question is from Omar Aragonis. Uh, hello, my question for Dr. Crumpler is how Mars surface simu simulations progressed over the years? The simulations? <laughs> yeah, the simulations obviously have gotten a lot better because we've gotten a much better uh, data at, uh, you know, simulating things. Um, and um, in particular, we, uh, you know, there's, a, it's mainly the details of the terrain that we've been lacking in. We, uh, you know, could see the surface from various landers and so on. And those always have this distorted view of kind of sitting, squatting down on the surface. It always looked pretty bad. So we usually design for uh, much more, um, uh, rockier terrains than uh, we've uh, actually experienced in many cases. Uh, so, um, you know, we've certainly learned a lot as we've moved along, and I think we're we're in a phase where we're about to learn even more about you know what we need in order to um, study Mars. For instance, right now we really focus a lot of our energies on doing a lot of analytical things with 
rocks and samples um, and a lot of the fundamental questions you would do if you were just walking on the surface here on the earth are kind of um, you know kind of secondary and so you end up uh, kind of kind of second guessing a lot of fundamental geologic things so uh, i think uh, you know we're just learning a lot and so as we learn our simulations are getting better and uh, so that's the part of the nature of the game as you're exploring a new world Thank you, Larry, and thank you, Omar. Uh, next question is from our very own uh, Associate Director, Selena Keneally. Uh, she asks, the uh, you said that Mars is like a trickster. What has hmm. been the biggest surprise on this mission? Yeah, let's see on this mission. Well, you know, uh, this is just like s several previous missions where we go to a lake bed we can see evidence that the lake was there, that there was a crater that was filled with a lake. There's got to be sediments. It's a sedimentary basin. And we go there, we see lava flows. <laughs> that happened, obviously, with Spirit when it went to Gusev Crater. And uh, we kind of knew there were going to be possibly lava flows here, but it was just kind of, I think, uh, shocking for a lot of the sedimentary geologists to actually have to cope with that fact. <laughs> so uh, yeah, Mars loves to do that sort of thing. Um, and over the years, it's done other things, you know, like, uh, you know, well, like the first flyby mission, you know, we saw Mars as a dead planet, craters and all that. And uh, then we finally went there and actually started seeing the real Mars. We actually accidentally had just been observing the ancient cratered highlands of Mars. And when we got to see the rest of Mars, we discovered that it was really a pretty <laughs> dynamic planet. There's a lot of stuff going on. So, I mean, you know, we, every time we do something with Mars, we think we you know, we understand it, and then it basically, is, you know, basically yanks the uh, the cover off our eyes, and we can actually see that it's not that at all. It's something totally different. And that's just happened over and over and over again. Um, even, the, you know, trying to sample this rock here, although a bunch of us thought that that rock was pretty corroded to try to sample, I think. For the general Mars community, you know, they were kind of shocked that you know that you couldn't drill every rock. You know that some rocks are just too weak, and Mars uh, showed us that side. And uh, you know, it just it goes on and on. It's, it's throughout the history of Mars, and so that was kind of a major theme in the book I wrote. In fact, I compared it Mars with the uh, stories of coyote and Native American legend um, because it's a, a trickster basically that really you know it causes you a lot of trouble but basically his ultimate goal was to teach you something and so i think that's the way we've um, kind of evolved as we've explored mars okay we have, we have a few more questions for you larry uh, next question is from ron will ingenuity help you with your gxm mapping with some dedicated flights uh, well, it, uh, it's not doing dedicated flights, but uh, just the images that it has taken have already been used in my mapping to do detailed mapping of the surface. I find that it's as good as the uh, panoramas that we take within 30 meters of things. So uh, I've actually filled in a couple of gaps. In fact, that first gap the, in the mapping uh, that happened with one of these long drives, the helicopter actually flew across that gap. And so I used that to fill in the gap. So it's been wonderful. It's, it's exactly what I anticipated, you know, having a helicopter would be uh, in order to extend the, uh, the, uh, the in-situ geologic mapping. So it's, it's, it's the way to go. It would be wonderful to have one that flew every day above the rover and took images looking down. Okay. Question is from Christina. What is the next big capability or improvement that you and the other scientists would desire from the next exploration rover? Uh, that's a good question. So, you know, we've got a big enough community now that everybody has their favorite. And of course, the instrument specialists want, you know, different, more capable instruments or something. And for me, I would just like to have a rover that uh, is able to. Uh, drive uh, uh, a bit more easily without so much um, uh, you know, drama. 
uh, and uh, visit things that uh, you know, would help you to understand the geologic context. So being a field geologist, you know, I'm used to being able to walk this way and then walk that way and walk over here and kind of get a big picture of a local area and map it as opposed to just, you know, walking along a line and, and trying to, to map along a field of view from a single traverse. So yeah, it's so a more capable rover. Um, uh, another, uh, you know, like I said, having an actual aerial platform that actually flies with the rover. Uh, all of that would be really wonderful. And uh, more importantly, I think a lot of us would just like to see more rovers, less complicated, so that we could send more to the uh, surface and explore different parts of Mars and kind of open up the geology textbook of Mars. Okay, the very last question comes from our very own communication specialist, Brittany. She asks, do you think the saffriolite-like rock on Mars preserve fossils? Yeah, well, uh, you know, well, the uh, Pixel uh, and Sherlock actually looked at it and I, I think there was just, it was trace amounts of something kind of anomalous. I, I don't think they found organic compounds, but you know, some, some odd chemicals and stuff like that. So, I mean, it's, it's possible that, you know, some of these deeply buried and water soaked rocks might actually have hosted um, if life existed, hosted uh, microbes. I mean, they certainly do on the earth. So, you know, it's uh, certainly uh, the type of terrain you might look at in the future. I think there's been a lot of focus on sediments on Mars, um, which is kind of a simplistic, you know, kind of layer cake geology, you know, 15th century view of you know, how geology works. The reality is that geology is a lot more than just sediments. It's uh, There's a lot of life uh, and preserved life in crystalline terrains, uh, including some of the oldest rocks on the earth. So. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, worth looking and it's certainly, uh, we've certainly seen some strange chemistry going on. So I wouldn't be surprised if someday we do see something, if we see life at all anywhere. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Larry Crumpler. That was an amazing and fascinating talk regarding the timeline and the history of your prestigious, uh, prestigious work. So. Let me just go ahead and share my screen one moment. Okay. Just for housekeeping purposes, thank you all for hanging out as well. Can we see that, Brittany? Yes. 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 Fabulous. All <laughs> right. Fabulous. Um, also, another big thank you to Dr. Uh, Larry Crumpler and then Anton Somali for his uh, welcome and introduction as well. Uh, we have a couple of exciting uh, programming notes coming up this week. Come on. Um, on Tuesday, tomorrow, November 9th at 10 a.m., we have a workshop by Dr. Anjali Mulshundani uh, using techno-economic analysis T to inform your R&D, and that will be held in the gather space. At from four to five tomorrow, we have our synchronous poster session with our student presenters. Um, please join us. We have 19 posters from various disciplines from all around the state of New Mexico. On Wednesday, November 10th, we at 2 p.m., we have our panel, Venturing into Space, How New Mexico Faculty is Reaching for the Stars and Taking Students Along the Journey. Uh, and that's um, gonna be quite exciting. Uh, Thursday, uh, poster judging is open. It's also Veterans Day. And then Friday, we conclude our program at 3 p.m. with student flash talks and our award ceremony for both our teachers and our poster winners. Um, we couldn't do this without our fabulous sponsors. We have, um, we have quite a lot of them. Uh, we have the New Mexico Academy of Science, New Mexico EPSCOR, the American Chemical Society, UNM Center for Water and the Environment, and the New Mexico Space Grant. Um, also again, thank you to the planning committee for making this event possible. Thank you all again for hanging out a little bit after our program. We'll see you all soon and have a great evening. <laughs>